For years, the only thing I associated with Detroit was the movie Robocop. Paul Verhoeven's 1987 cyberpunk classic depicts the city as a crime-ridden dystopian wasteland, not like the real Detroit at all. That movie had everything. Explosions, car chases, toxic waste turning a dude into pudding, and of course, a cyborg police officer. A Robocop, if you will. But you know what it didn't have? Pizza. Maybe that's because Robocop's favourite food is actually chicken nuggets? Mm. Chicken. Every regional food eventually gets its moment of ridiculous internet hype and for the past few years it's been time to put your hands up for Detroit and then put your hands behind your back and get on your knees. A rectangle instead of a circle, a fluffy thick crust instead of thin and chewy, sauce above the cheese instead of underneath, it's like pizza from an alternate dimension. The most hyped Detroit pizza place near me charges $37 for a large pizza. Those are maple syrup dollars by the way, not assault rifle dollars. And paying that kind of money for what is essentially bread and cheese is like mugging yourself. So. I've been making my own and this is how I do it. Into the bowl of a stand mixer I'm adding water, instant yeast, salt, sugar and olive oil. Give that a mix and then in goes the flour. Compared to my New York pizza dough this has a much higher level of hydration which is going to make the bread airy and light but it also means the dough is going to be very sticky and difficult to work with. The dough hook is kind of useless in this scenario so I'm using the paddle attachment and I'm just mixing it for a few minutes. It'll start off as a sticky mess, but as the flour hydrates, it'll start to pull away from the bowl more cleanly. Divide it into two equal pieces and then place those in an oiled container. Since we're not worried about having to stretch these into perfect circles later, the shape isn't too important, so just chuck them in there. Cover with the trusty shower cap and then these are going to cold ferment in the fridge overnight. The next day, the dough won't have risen much or increased in volume, but we can see that there's plenty of yeasty activity going on, which is good. At this point, I'm going to give the dough a few stretch and folds, which is a fairly common technique with higher hydration doughs like this to help build structure and incorporate some air. Get your hand nice and wet. So so the dough doesn't stick as much, then just pull up from one side and fold it over. Rotate it 90 degrees and repeat three more times. Now again just roughly shape it into a ball, cover it and I'm moving it to a cold oven for a few hours to come up to room temp. I decided to make two pizzas, a kind of traditional but not really traditional margarita and a pepperoni obviously. Usually I don't bother cooking pizza sauce because it basically does enough cooking in the oven but for the classic Detroit style where the sauce goes on top, I prefer to cook the sauce and finish the pizza with it after it's been baked. I'm using the same full red sauce as I used in my New York style video and adding some olive oil, salt, pepper and oregano. Then I'll bring it up to a simmer and just let it bubble away for a few minutes. I'm just trying to take away a bit of the harsh raw tomato flavour, maybe 10 minutes on a low heat is all it will take. Then take it off the stove and keep it aside for later. Don't get mad at me but I'm also making a white sauce to go on the margarita because it's just so good. Start with some butter and thinly slice a clove of garlic. Let that get toasty in a saucepan then throw in a pinch of dried basil, pepper, salt, chilli flake and garlic powder. Then the flour and just combine that to make a roux. I'm adding cold milk in three instalments, whisking it all together until smooth then some grated parm and just taste it for seasoning and adjust it if necessary. Let it simmer slowly for about 10 minutes, it'll thicken a bit and will cook away any taste of raw flour. Now this is delicious as is but I want a little acidity in there to balance it out. I don't want to add lemon juice and risk curdling the milk so I'm adding some buttermilk which will give us a nice lactic tang. Whisk it up until it's velvety and smooth and then keep that aside as well. Alright, this is a Detroit pizza pan. It's 10 inches by 8, which is a standard size and it's super sturdy and nothing sticks to it. For the final proofing of the dough, I'm going to grease this bad boy with a little Crisco, which in my experience will give us a crispier finish than using oil. Our dough has been proofing for 4 hours. I did another set of stretch and folds after 2 hours, FYI, and it's doubled in size and gotten very bubbly. 
I'm transferring it to the pizza pan, spreading it out to roughly cover the bottom, then that gets covered and goes back in the oven with just the light on for some warmth. I repeat, this oven is not on. It's cold, but it's warmer than my kitchen, so it's a good place to let it proof. This is Ezo pepperoni. It's a bit pricier than bog standard supermarket stuff, but I really like it, so that's what I'm using for my pepperoni pizza. Now, the gospel of Detroit pizza dictates that the cheese is usually brick cheese or a combination of brick and mozzarella. Here's the thing. Brick cheese is pretty hard to find outside of a certain region of the United States. And if you do, it's pricey. This stuff was over $19 a pound and honestly, it's not much different to regular white cheddar. So is brick cheese worth getting at three times the price of cheddar? Absolutely not. But for this video, I'm using a 50-50 blend of brick and mozzarella. I prefer to blitz the cheese in a food processor a few times to get these little dice rather than shred it, but that's personal preference, you do you. Preheat the oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit and for the love of God, take your pan out of the oven first if you were proofing it in there like I was. I only have one pan, so I'm doing the margarita first. Drizzle some of that lovely white sauce all over the bottom and then I'm just sprinkling some of the cheese around the edges of the pan. One of the characteristics of Detroit pizza is that really dark burnt cheese around the outside and I like it really dark so I'm giving the edges a head start. That goes in the oven for 5 minutes, then I take it out. As you can see we're already getting a little browning around the outside. Throw on the rest of the cheese and put it back in for another 10 minutes. Man alive. The cheese is melted in the middle and it's crunchy and dark around the outside. Now, I'm just using a spatula to prise the edges away from the pan and then it should lift right out pretty easily. The sauce that we cooked earlier is going on top in two stripes. God, look at those edges. A little finely chopped parsley to finish. And why would you ever pay $37 for a pizza when you can do this at home? Even after you buy the pan and the ingredients, you'll be making money in no time. And is it good? Well, you've got bright and zesty red sauce, rich and creamy white sauce, oozing cheese, a really light and airy crumb, and the best part, crunchy edges. But let's keep our eyes on the prize. We have another pizza to make. For this one, I spread the dough out on the bottom of the pan as before, and instead of using pre-cooked sauce, I just use some of the full red sauce straight from the can with a little seasoning added. This time I'm adding all of the cheese before baking and then the pepperoni on top and that's going in the oven for about 15 minutes. Like I said, I like my edges really dark, but if you want them to be more golden brown, then take it out a couple of minutes early. I mean, there's not much to say other than that is a mighty fine pizza. I reckon this could convert Robo from his beloved chicken nuggets. A drizzle of hot honey will give a nice contrast of sweet and salty and a little heat. And that's it. I would definitely buy that for a dollar. Maybe even 37.